In this video book summary, we're going to review and summarize the book titled Choosing a Bible by Leland Riken. Before we get into the book summary, first of all, I'd like to remind you that the YouCanStudyTheBible.com website is available to you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. It contains blogs related to Bible study, written book reviews and software reviews, as well as video reviews like you're watching now and video training. So remember, you can go to YouCanStudyTheBible.com to learn about Bible study, to gain access to video training materials, and more. Now I want to begin this video summary by describing the purpose of the book in the words of the author. From the back cover of the book, we learn that the book introduces readers to the central issues in this debate and presents several reasons why essentially literal translations, word for word, are superior to dynamic equivalent translations, or thought for thought. Now, this points out that we're dealing with the debate over how the Bible should be translated into English, or for that matter, into other languages. This is the key focus of the book, Choosing the Bible, subtitled, Understanding Bible Translation Differences. Now, Leland Riken is a Ph.D. with the University of Oregon. He is the professor of English at Wheaton College. In addition to this book, he's authored or edited several other books, including The Word of God in English, The Dictionary of Biblical Imagery, which I have on my shelf as well, and The Complete Literary Guide to the Bible. He's a frequent speaker at the Evangelical Theological Society and served as literary stylist for the Holy Bible English Standard Version. So this tells you a little bit about the author of the book and the purpose of the book's creation. Now let's look at the table of contents. This is a very small book. The book totals only 32 pages, including a one-page appendix. So it is not very large. It is a quick read. Chapter 1 is titled, How Do Bible Translations Differ from Each Other? And it has two subsections, The Goal of Bible Translation and Thought for Thought or Word for Word. And then chapter 2 is titled, Five Negative Effects of Dynamic Equivalence. This is where the author deals with five different arguments, wherein he suggests that the dynamic equivalent translations are not as good as Bible translations as the essentially literal translations. And then chapter 3 is titled, 10 Reasons We Can Trust Essentially Literal Bible Translations. And here he gives 10 strong arguments for why the essentially literal Bible translations may be best. Finally, there is an appendix which gives you a Bible translation chart, and there are also notes included as well. Now let's begin by reviewing chapter 1. But before I get into the specific comments within chapter 1, I do want to point out that when the author of this book refers to essentially literal translations, he's talking about what has traditionally been called word-for-word -word translations. Do not confuse this with a literal translation. A literal translation often leaves the words in the order they were in the Greek or the Hebrew, which may not make as much sense to an English reader. An essentially literal translation interprets or translates the words, and after it translates those words, it puts them in the proper order for grammar and syntax of the English language. Now in chapter 1, which was titled, How Do Bible Translations Differ from Each Other? First of all, we have the goal. Now this particular section in the book is focused on explaining the goal of Bible translation. Until recent years, to translate the words of the original text into the words of modern languages as much as the process allows was the goal of Bible translation. So the goal was to translate the words of the Greek and the Hebrew into words in the receptor language, the target language, or English if we're translating it into English. Now the recent theory is to translate the thoughts of the author into modern language. So this is really the crux of the debate. Do we translate word to word, or do we translate thoughts to words? And that is the key here. So the second section of chapter 1 is thought for thought or word for word. The author argues that we really should be looking at word for word and not thought for thought. 
Here's the question. Can translators know the thought behind the words? That is to say, can they say, or have the authority to say, that, well, God must have been thinking X or Y, and therefore we will translate it according to what he was thinking, rather than what he said? Here's another thought. Can they know the words that express the thought? The answer to that is absolutely yes. Translators cannot know the thought behind the words, but they can know the words that express the thought. Therefore, the argument for translating word for word rather than thought for thought is a more solid argument, according to the author of this book. Now, moving on to chapter 2, we deal with the five negative effects of dynamic equivalence. The first negative effect that the author mentions is taking liberties in translation. The point here is that the author suggests dynamic equivalence takes liberties in translating the precise wording of the original that we would not allow in other areas of life. In other words, if I wrote a book and someone was translating it into another language, would I allow them to reinterpret my meaning, or would I simply expect them to translate my words into the matching words in the receptor language? This is the concept. Now, the things that the author suggests the dynamic equivalence translators do is that they change words that were deemed old-fashioned or difficult into more contemporary and colloquial language. They change a metaphor or direct statement because of an assumption that your audience could not handle the figurative language. They eliminate a word that the editor regarded as a technical theological term and replaced it with a plain non-technical term. They reduce the level of vocabulary to a junior high school level or seventh grade level. These are among some of the suggestions that the author makes that are the liberties taken by the translators when they do a dynamic equivalence translation. The second charge is the destabilization of the text. Here's the issue. If the dynamic equivalent translations are able to translate whatever the interpreters think the text means into the English language, and then they disagree on the meaning, the result is we have many different translations. Now, we really don't. We have many different commentaries, is what we really have. But the books are sold as if they're a translation of the Bible. This is the argument of the reader, that they're sold as a translation, but in many cases they're really a translation plus commentary, or they're simply a commentary. The third argument is what the Bible means versus what the Bible says. The author suggests it is an easy step from the point of destabilization of the text that dynamic equivalent translations lack adequate controls on translation to the next point that dynamic equivalent translations often make it impossible to know what the Bible means because they remove from sight what the Bible says. So how do we know what the Bible means if we don't know what the Bible says? An example would be that if a translation takes a particular interpretation of a phrase and then places that interpretation in the text of their Bible, rather than the actual words simply translated into English, the result is the reader of that Bible has no option left to find a different interpretation of the text. This is the issue of what the Bible means versus what the Bible says. And then the fourth argument is falling short of what we should expect. The author says, and I quote, My fourth objection against dynamic equivalent translations is that, because of what I have already said, these translations fall short of what the Bible reading public should rightfully expect. After all, what is the minimal assumption we make when we pick up any book, whether a Bible translation or novel? We assume that we have before us what the author actually wrote subject to the necessary changes required by translation if the book is a translation. The author is arguing that the dynamic equivalent translations take liberties in translation, which result in destabilization of the text, which remove what the Bible says and put in place what they feel the Bible means, and that's simply not what people expect. What people expect when they buy a Bible translation is that they're getting the Word of God translated into their language, and not what someone interprets the Word of God to say. And finally, the author suggests 
that the fifth negative effect of dynamic equivalent translation is a logical and linguistic impossibility. The author states, dynamic equivalence claims to translate the thought rather than the words of the original. My claim is that this is impossible. The fallacy of thinking that a translation should translate the meaning rather than the words of the original is simple. There is no such thing as disembodied thought, emancipated from words. Ideas and thoughts depend on words and are expressed by them. So the author is herein suggesting that the translators cannot even really accomplish what they say they're trying to accomplish because you cannot use anything other than words to convey the thought. The author, God, has already conveyed his thoughts. And if we believe in the plenary inspiration of the Bible, that's word-for-word -word inspiration, then we want those words that God inspired. This brings us to chapter 3, the positive affirmations for the essentially literal Bible translations. It is titled, 10 Reasons We Can Trust Essentially Literal Bible Translations. The first one is, Transparency to the Original. The author states, except where a completely literal translation would have been unintelligible to an English reader, an essentially literal translation is transparent to the original text. It's a true translation of the text to our language without trying to interpret the intended meaning of the author. Second, keeping to the essential task of translation. The author states, you can trust an essentially literal translation to keep to the essential task of translation, namely, translation. So the author is suggesting the job of the translator is to translate and not to interpret. Interpretation comes for application, for exegesis, and so on. Number three, preserving the full interpretive potential of the original. Herein, the author suggests that if you have interpreted the original texts of the Bible, and you have written your interpretation as if it were the text of the Bible, you have removed the ability of the individual to interpret that text as they are led by the Spirit of God. So the only way we preserve the ability of the saints to interpret the Word of God is if we actually have the words of God. Number four, not mixing commentary with translation. The author states, you can trust an essentially literal translation not to mislead you by mixing commentary and translation. I have found in my studies many times and this is outside of the scope of Leland Riken's book, that when using other translations that are in the category of dynamic equivalence translations, such as the Message and the New International Version, that we find these Bibles often add lengthy phrases to the text that are not at all in the original text. This is not giving me what I expect when I buy a Bible. I expect to get the Word of God simply translated into English, not the Word of God plus the thoughts of the translator. Number five, preserving theological precision. The author states, you can trust an essentially literal translation to preserve theological precision. In other words, the essentially literal translation gives you the words of God translated into English and not the thoughts of the translator. Therefore, we can trust that when we develop theology from those words, we are developing the theology that God delivered to us. Number six, not needing to correct the translation in preaching. We don't have to worry about saying, now I know that this NIV says this, or I understand that this New Living Translation says this, but actually that is not at all in the Bible. And these are just the thoughts of the translators. Now, that could be embarrassing as a minister to have to say something like that from the pulpit to the saints. So it's better to use an essentially literal translation would be the author's feelings when you're doing any type of public exhortation because they do not require correction in preaching. Now, I want to add a note here to indicate that in fairness, some essentially literal translations do indeed need to be corrected 
during preaching. But it's not so much because they weren't a word-for-word translation of the Word of God, but it's because they're so old that the meaning of words have changed. A good example is in the King James Version, the word let means to hinder or to prevent or to hold back. But today, if I say I'm going to let you, it means I'm going to allow you or push you forward, not hold you back. So certainly some of the older translations do still need correction. The big difference is that we are correcting the translation of individual words in most cases and not entire phrases or even verses that have been inserted by the translator. Number seven, preserving what the biblical writers actually wrote. Because we're translating word for word, we're getting what they wrote just in our language. Number eight, preserving the literary qualities of the Bible. The author states the following, If your essentially literal translation is the Revised Standard Version, the English Standard Version, or the New King James Version, in other words, if your essentially literal translation rides the literary coattails of the matchless King James Version, you can trust it to preserve the literary qualities of the Bible that the King James Version gave to the English-speaking world for nearly four centuries. When he speaks of these literary translations, he's saying that we're maintaining the metaphors We're maintaining the similes and the other figures of speech that are there without translating them into some modern words or phrases. Number nine, preserving the dignity and beauty of the Bible. The author suggests that you can trust some essentially little translations to preserve the exaltation, dignity, and beauty of the Bible. He gives a good example from Revelations 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Compare that to the R-E-B translation. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. The beauty of it, the grandeur of it, does seem to be lacking. Finally, number 10, consistency with the doctrine of inspiration. To me, this one is the absolute most important of all of the 10. Because in this case, what we find is that if we are getting a word-for-word translation, then we have the English words representing the Greek and Hebrew words. And I personally believe in the plenary inspiration of the Word of God, which means that God inspired the words. Jesus said, not one word will pass away. The scriptures speak of the Word of God that came to the prophets. The simple fact is that the tradition of the church has been plenary inspiration. If we do not translate word for word as much as possible, then we are losing the inspired text, and instead we're getting a commentary on the text. Finally, this small booklet has an excellent appendix. It's a Bible translation chart. It lists for you the essentially literal translations that are popular. There is the New American Standard Bible, the English Standard Version, the King James Version, and the New King James Version, the Revised Standard Version, and the New Revised Standard Version. I have also added the Holman Christian Standard Bible, which is a newer, essentially literal translation that doesn't get as much press, but in my experience with it, it is an exceptional translation as well. But that is my statement, and not that of Leland Riken, the author of this booklet. The dynamic equivalent translations listed by the author are the New International Version and today's New International Version, the New Living Translation, the Contemporary English Bible, as well as the Good News Bible. He also suggests that there are paraphrased translations that go even further. These are the New Testament in Modern English, the Message, the Living Bible, the Street Bible. These are just a few examples of paraphrases. I would actually place these in the dynamic equivalence category myself, but I would suggest that indeed they do go one major step further. Here's the way I generally suggest the use of these translations to those that I disciple and that I teach when they first come into the church. I suggest that an essentially literal translation, which by the way is also known as a formal translation, is the best for studying the Word of God and treating it as the Word of God in English. And then I suggest that a dynamic equivalent translation is okay to use as a commentary, but you just want to keep in mind 
that it is indeed that. It's a commentary. There's nothing wrong with having commentaries. I have dozens and dozens of commentaries on my shelves. I have Bible software with hundreds of commentaries. And so commentaries are super valuable to us in our study. I love to read what the message has to say about a particular verse, because to me, that is the author's commentary, the author of the message. It's his commentary on what that verse is all about. But when I want to study the Word of God and look at the words of God, I'm looking at the essentially literal translations. I hope you found this video book summary helpful. If you're interested in getting a copy of Choosing a Bible, Understanding Bible Translation Differences by Leland Riken, it is available at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, and other bookstores where you may choose to shop.